Good evening, everybody. Please stand up for the national anthem. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Shairi De Silva. I'm the curator at the Lunaganga Trust. Before we get to the main event in today's program, the 16th annual Jeffrey Bauer Memorial Lecture delivered by Kenga Kuma, we'd like to take just a few moments to reflect on Jeffrey Bauer, whose 100th birthday falls today. So I'd like to invite to the stage Channa Vaswathe, trustee of the Jeffrey Bauer and Lunaganga Trust, to speak just a few words. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 16th uh, annual uh, Jeffrey Bauer Memorial Lecture. I've just been asked to say a few words about Jeffrey Bauer. A 100th birthday, of course, is a very Im Im uh, uh, commemoration of a 100th birthday is a very important landmark for anything. In the case of Jeffrey Bauer, it's also commemorating a great national figure who 20 years after he stopped working still remains relevant and still remains inspirational to many people, not just architects, but to artists, to people who make music and to so many others around not just our country, but in our region and in the world. Thinking of Jeffrey today, having worked with him for six years and then having been with him when his illness, it brings back various memories to me. And uh, I won't forget the first time I met him uh, at Lunuganga, where our then teacher Anjalendran dragged us along to see Lunuganga, and we were all curious as to what it was like. And one of the things I was, I was stunned, of course, at seeing such a beautiful garden for the first time in my life. And then, I was also very, very amused at how wonderful and simple a man he was when my friend Anoma Pires, who was a bachelorette of mine, now a professor at Melbourne University, started imitating a dog and sort of started howling and Jeffrey thought it was utterly amusing. And that was the great highlight of the evening for most of us, in addition to seeing this incredible garden. Years later, one summer I had a call from Jeffrey, as he would call when I was in studying in London. And he'd said, oh, Chana, come and have lunch with us. And I said, fine. And then I had this sort of major drama because I had promised a friend of mine that I'll catch a train with him to fly, to, to go off to Paris at three o'clock from London, Victoria. I was finishing the last paper of my examination. So there was this whole drama of, my God, how do I do this? And somehow managed lunch. And there, there was Jeffrey Bauer at his friend's Jean and Christoph's house, and we started having lunch. And of course, he was, in many ways, interviewing me for a job. And he showed me wonderful pictures of a gorgeous Sri Lankan site. Channa had been away for a few years, and I was sort of every rosy-eyed sort of notion of what Sri Lanka was. And it was the site for the Kandalama Hotel. And Jeffrey said, look, we're building a hotel here. Why don't you join us? And of course, at that time, there was, no, there, was, there was no saying no. I, of course, thought that I must be, oh gosh, my 
university college education and perhaps some great intellectual notion that, that I had great intellectual notions about myself. So I thought, wow, he's selected me for a job. Little did I realize that I was actually going to chosen as his walking stick. And for the next six years, he used a live walking stick on one side and a beautiful, first the resin one during the day and a wonderful bone and Indian rosewood one for the night. And I would sort of accompany him, not just to sites, but occasionally to other social events as well. And I began to realize that it really was a wonderful highlight of my life because I was right up and in front of Jeffrey's life and all the various things that happened. In fact, a step in front of him. And I could observe all the various bits and pieces, all the, the praise, the honor, and occasional brickbats that would come at Jeffrey. And for the next six years of my life, all my sort of pretensions of intellectual glamour was gone. I was just a walking stick, occasionally put to work as an architect. And some of my friends who are here in the audience, like Amila, who's here right in front, would quite remember some of those memorable moments with Jeffrey. One of them I'll never forget was that Amila and I was in this van on the way to the Kandalama site. And both of us looked at each other in complete horror, knowing that seeing what had happened on site and how awful it was. And the then site engineer, the late Milroy Pereira, and our in engineer Deepal probably noticed it as well. And Jeffrey would got, got out of the car and said, Chana, lean me against that tree. For the first and only time in his life, he wasn't sure if I could support him in his fury. He leaned against the tree and the engineer, hiding behind the architect who was slightly more rotund than the engineer, came slowly up and Jeffrey said, I cannot pretend that I'm not outraged, he said. I'll never forget that. I cannot pretend that I'm not outraged, he, kept, he said in a completely calm voice. Because what had happened was that the contractors had blown up a rock on which there was a beautiful sort of sapling banyan tree, which Jeffrey had had on every one of the drawings from the very beginning. And my other friend Sumangala, if he's here, will attest to that, because it was one of the, the, the trees that was on the drawing. In every drawing, there was Afkandalama. Of course, and then he said, and Deepal, do you think that your wall is going to be stronger than this million-year-old rock? Deepal, of course, very sheepishly, sort of admitted it wasn't, but eventually he did build a fantastic wall to hold on to this little tree that was left hanging for dear life on a shard of rock. And today, if you go up to Kandalama, that magnificent tree is there for all to see, also propped up by Deepal's wall. So all of these things, really, I remember a man who was really sharp about what he wanted. He knew what he wanted. He knew what he didn't want. And he was very sure about what he did, but was also, there were moments of insecurity. And for a man who smoked a hundred cigarettes, and when he once gave up overnight, I asked him, why did you ever smoke so many cigarettes if you could give up so quickly? And he said, I needed something to hold in my hand. And that was the only reason he smoked. But of course, that was also the, a, a sign of the fact that he was not completely sure of everything he did. And I realized there was this wonderful human being who did things because he believed in it. And like all of us, when we do things that we believe in, we, there are little pangs of doubt. But you do it all the same because you believe. And that's one of the things that I took away from me. And brickbats he got. I'll never forget a letter that, I got, that we got from a travel operator after the Kandalama Hotel finished. I can teach Jeffrey Bauer to build hotels. What sort of thing has he built? Because as soon as it was built, there was a lot of criticism for its simplicity and its grace. But years later, talking with Jeffrey, he said, look, Chana, this building will only be complete when bears are sleeping in its rooms and leopards are walking its corridors. There was this idea that the completion of the building was in the future, that buildings don't get completed the moment an architect thinks it's complete. Buildings take their own life. And Jeffrey understood that very, very clearly. And if you look at a lot of his buildings, you'll see that 
they're allowed to take this notion that the Japanese who, 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 who appreciate it called wabi-sabi. The idea that there is always decay and in that decay is a renewal. And Jeffrey, I think, understood that perfectly. And for Kandalama, that's what he really intended. And years later, after he had got his stroke and I had been retired from being a walking stick, I was pushing him along in his wheelchair through a particular place in Kandalama which connects the main public areas to the room wing. As I wheeled him out of that, that corridor, he put his feet down. By then he couldn't speak. He simply put his feet down, stopped me from pushing him further forward, and started weeping. And then I looked at what he might have seen, and there was the hotel in the full glory of what he intended it to be. He saw it for the first time five years after we had finished the hotel. The creepers had grown, everything was flourishing, and there were monkeys on the, on the roof, and that was the beginning of the completion of his building. And for me, that's, that was also a great takeaway from him, that nothing really can be complete, nothing can be a hugely egotistical object that we leave in the world, but we leave things that will change and that will become better as they mature. So those are some of the memories I have of the great man. And what he did uh, still obviously inspires a lot of us, and I'm sure it will continue to inspire us for years to come. And today, on his 100th birthday, um, I hope that his memory lingers and some of these lessons uh, that I learned are perhaps transmitted to a younger generation and I can see a whole lot of young architects here and young students here and begin to learn that some of these things are what you need to take more seriously than the notion of building a perfect building that you think you leave for the rest of the world. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening um, and I'd like to also say thank you very much to Kumasan who's, um, who insisted with me that he must be here on Jeffrey's 100th birthday and I really thank him so much for having accepted our invitation and he's here to speak um, on this very, very significant day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chana, for that lovely reflection. I'd now like to invite Dr. Sean Anderson, who will speak a little bit more about Jeffrey Bauer's legacy. Dr. Anderson joins us today from New York, where he is the Associate Curator of Architecture and Design at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Good evening. Are you born? Vanakam. Greetings. I'm rather humbled and very happy to have this opportunity to speak to all of you tonight. Uh, on one hand, this is, uh, Sri Lanka has always been a second home to me. I came here 15 years ago, not expecting, not expecting in a way to learn great humility and great generosity that I have found uh, not only in the buildings of Jeffrey Bawa and others, but also among all of you uh, at all ages. Sri Lanka has become, in a sense, an extension of my home in New York City and my work at the Museum of Modern Art, where we are undertaking a major exhibition that will open in 2021, looking at trying to understand, in, in a way, uh, South Asian architecture. And at the center of that exhibition is uh, a number of works by Bawa, as well as others. So this evening, I wanted to kind of talk about my understanding of Bawa on this important day, not only as an architect, but also as a historian, as someone uh, who came to Sri Lanka and began to learn architecture again. And so I was trying to think of titles, I was trying to think of ways in which uh, perhaps I could introduce Kumasan uh, and to think about what it means to live today 
in a country, in a world that is incredibly fractured, incredibly uh, divided, but to look at and think about architecture that actually has fundamentally brought people together in different ways. So the title, uh, if you will, is called Nature Near. And this is a little bit of a crib from uh, the architect Richard Neutra, who, when he arrived in Southern California in the 1950s, exclaimed that for the first time in his life, architecture and the environment, that kind of fourth wall, if you will, of the theater, of the nature, was in effect the most important thing, that nature became near. But I wanted to begin a little bit before Bawa, a little bit before what we understand to be uh, perhaps a canonical kind of modern or modernism, and to think and look at the works of the 43 group, about whom I am incredibly invested and in very interested, as is the museum and its curators. And we can't go farther than the center of, of the 43 group with Lionel Went and his images of people and places and landscapes in which not only Sri Lanka is featured and is present, but we look beyond the image and we look beyond the shadow to understand that Went and his, his associates and like Bawa began to understand that nature was but an extension of not only this world, but the worlds in which we live. So when we see works like this from the late 1930s or early 40s, uh, Went is obviously a keen experimenter with form, with light, with the image, how to make an image. And in fact, this work is called Adventure in Space. But I'd like to think about historical images, historical buildings also found on the island that have found uh, presence also in the work of Went 43 Group and Bawa, such as uh, Nagalaswaram Temp uh, Kovil in Jaffna, where the framing of space and the framing of nature are one and the same. That our presence and our past meet at the image, at this horizon that Went and others found great inspiration from. And so these are two works, kind of uh, looking at an early work of Went and a later work of Went, uh, where he's experimenting with double exposure. And I find when you look at these two, you understand that Went uh, and the 43 group were very much interested in time as Chana said. And this time then found root also in his colleagues, such as Ivan Pires, where I can't help but think that this Ambalama, this canonical architectural form that has, is open on all sides to nature and to the landscape, is one point from which you can understand your relationship to the world around you. But I wanted to step back for one moment and say where I learned first of Bawa. And I had the great privilege of being a research assistant in my second year in architecture school with Bonnie McDougall, who was married to Robert McDougall, both of whom were anthropologists. And in the 19, early 1960s uh, and late 50s, they came to the Knuckles region and began documenting the architecture uh, in and around uh, a number of villages. And I began to investigate what these drawings and these images that they were taking at the time meant for them. And Bonnie uh, was very adamant that I understand that these drawings, here is an axonometric of, of an interior of a house and a plan, each of which uh, is heavily indexed, both in Singhala and English, of every object from the smallest to the largest. It's cataloged, it's remarked upon, it's understood that these small elements, these components became a metaphor or a symbol 
a larger imagination, if you will, of the interior of a Sri Lankan house. And I can't help but think then that 10 years prior, we have the work of Philip Johnson, who also was thinking about the objects in space, not only the house, but the objects in the house and the relationship of these objects outward and inward with his uh, now canonical glass house of 1949. So where do we find Bala? Where in his trajectory can we locate the beginning, perhaps, of nature being near? And I thought that with the remarkable work that the Trust and, and Amila have done to reconstruct Ina's house at Lunaganga, we begin to understand that every object in a Jeffrey Bawa house or building, every plane, every image is constructed, is considered, and is imagined as part of a larger whole. Even the surface of the ground becomes part of an extension of that ground and a relationship of the ground to the house and further beyond. Or like the Palantalawa estate bungalow in which one is forced to be confronted with and pass through these boulders from the front gate inward. Or the most recent addition to the trust's uh, collection, if you will, of, of Bawa uh, homes with the Charmini and, and Druvi de Saram house. That the relationship between this tree and the, the color and the stairs behind it are not only well considered, but understood as being one and the same. They are both pathways to another experience. And that Jeffrey would understand that our relationship through and, uh, through and beyond these screens were meant not only to suggest what might lie in he ahead of us, but also where we came from. So my first experience of a, of a Bawa building, in fact, was this one that uh, Chana described. And I think it is a befitting image to imagine that on one side you have a million year old boulder or set of boulders and on the other a smooth plane that is not only intention but one creating an interest, a path, a way forward. And that Jeffrey was always considerate of where and how one saw the world and nature such as the interior of the Steel Corporation offices and what he saw from his front porch at Lunaganga, this ordering of the landscape, these lines that become a ground, an aqueous ground, that become water, or that these stairs, like the roots of the tree that I started with, are a pathway upward, outward, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. I would li now like to take just a few minutes to speak on the Bawa 100 Centenary Celebration Program. The Lunuganga and Jeffrey Bawa Trusts have launched this year-long program to celebrate Jeffrey Bawa's legacy, to reflect on the important work and relationships that were part of his practice, and also to continue his efforts to foster architecture and the arts in Sri Lanka. The Centenary Program is comprised of a series of events, talks, and tours. And with all that has happened, especially in the last three months, uh, the Trust has thought very deeply about continuing with this program and its intentions. And we feel strongly that it is more important than ever that we nurture the arts in this island. So I hope you will all join us as we continue this year um, with our program. Now to tonight's main event. It is an incredible honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Kinga Kuma. Kuma-san is not really an architect who needs an introduction. 
given his stature in the discipline. His work includes many prestigious projects, including the recently completed buildings for the Victoria and Albert Museum in Dundee, Scotland, the Hiroshige Museum of Art in Tochigi, as well as the soon to be completed Olympic Stadium for the 2020 Olympics in Japan. Each of these projects are astoundingly beautiful in their forms, immaculate in their craftsmanship, and thoughtful in their use of materials. But for me personally, what has been so admirable and inspiring about Kuma-san's work is the way in which each building addresses its location, not only by using local materials and adapting traditional techniques, but also because they are designed to engineer processes and have a reach that is far deeper than the footprint of the building. Kuma-san's work questions the habits of the contemporary city and mobilizes the deployment of traditional construction techniques and crafts in innovative ways, offering a sustainable counterpoint to the relentless concrete, and steel, and glass structures that tyrannize today's cities. Whether he is designing an 8,500 square meter museum or a small forest pavilion, in every project, Kumasan explains, explores these principles and the agency of design beyond the creation of form. It is an especial privilege to have you deliver this lecture tonight, Mr. Kuma, as we celebrate Jeffrey Bauer's 100th birthday, because we know that so many of these values were held dear by Bauer as well and his work is a testament to these explorations. So without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kengo Kuma to the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me as a, uh, as a, on that special day as he was born. 100 years ago, this today, uh, July 23rd. And uh, as, uh, he is still giving me many inspiration and many hint for buildings. And uh, today I want to show as, uh, how as, uh, he still is uh, as important for us. And, uh, and I want to start the showing the Nuganga. The, in the last of lecture, I will show the small pavilions we are designing for the garden. It's, it's a great honor for us to design something with him. And also the Kandarama, uh, the always giving me many hint about screens, integration with greens, uh, respect topography, that kind of things. And, as, and luckily, as we are doing the renovation for this Club Villa Hotel he designed. The, the, my friend Murakami-san the, the, the bought that hotel and as uh, I as he asked me to do the renovation, but as I don't want to change the building, and I try to respect his detail and his material as possible as can. And, uh, and, there's, uh, and it's, it's almost completed. And uh, so I want to ask you to come to the hotel to see what I did. As I did this very small thing, what I did. And the, I, I want to start the, this project because this is a project, the museum for this ukiyo-e artist, Hiroshige, is a, is a, I got many hint from him. The, this ukiyo-e, the, the unique thing is, is rain. The Hiroshige uh, treated the lane as a screen in the space. The lane is vertical lines and, uh, and it uh, creates the layers in front of bleach. And the bleach is also treated 
as screen. And the layers of screens is creating depths. And, uh, and I think it's very architectural solution. And another example of Hiroshige is the screens and layers and depths. And uh, the, this is, uh, was done by Vincent van Gogh. And Vincent van Gogh has learned many things from Hiroshige. And the, the, the Hiroshige the, the gave the hint to Impressionism. And another good example of cultural exchange. And the Bawa is the same. The cultural exchange between Europe and Sri Lanka, the, he, the, through that kind of exchange, the, he brings a new history to architecture of 20th century. And at my Hiroshige Museum, the, the roof is very important, as Rudnuganga. And, uh, and also, the, I try to the, connect the building to the mountain. <clears throat> the, the, this, this hole is the most important part of the building. The, the building is just next to, next to the mountain. And in Japan, the most of villages are sitting at the edge of mountain. And that kind of mountain, as we call them, Sato Yama. Sato means village, and Yama means mountain and the village mountain. And the people's life are totally the, depends on the nature of Satoyama. And uh, uh, material came from the mountain. And energy also came from the mountain. Because there were no electric company, no gas company, the, and people would, the uh, boils of water, so the showers, and the cooking. The, the mountain was used for source of energy. And the people's life totally depends on the, uh, the, the resource of mountain. And then people respected the mountain very much. And then people built the shrine beside the, as the edge of mountain. And the shrine is, is, a, is a strong message to the people. As if we destroy the forest, destroy the mountain, so we cannot survive anymore, that's a strong message of shrine. But in 20th century, the, the people didn't respect mountain anymore because energy and materials, everything came from big city, in case of Tokyo, and the mountain was abandoned. And my wish, so my idea, is to reconnect mountain and the village again by cutting the building, cutting the small hole in the building. This is a small hole in the building, and I'm going back to this. This is the hole. And from the village, people can feel the mountain feel the shrine. And, uh, the, and also, the, in Bawa's building, the, I feel his love to mountain, he tried to connect mountain and building. And material-wise, I try to use material from mountain. And the, the roof, even the roof, so we did use wood from the mountain behind. And as I try to create shadow. And shadow is, is very important for Bauer as well. His building, the sunlight is very strong here in Sri Lanka, but in his building, so we can enjoy beauty of shadow. And, uh, and I also 
or try to create beautiful shadow besides building in the building. And in the building, the material the, is started from rice paper screen, the local stone, and the local wood. And again, I try to create layers of screen. And the layers of screen is creating depths. You can see the three layers in the building and the transparent but feel depths of space. And in Western painting, deep depths is, was created by perspective method. But in Asian painting, the depths is not coming from perspective method. The layering and the, and the, the, and the colors that we are creating, the depths of space. And uh, so in China, so we try to use bamboo for the building because bamboo is very important for Asia. And this bamboo house, we didn't want to cut the topography. So we tried to preserve original topography as it was. And then the building is following the topography. Like that. And the material, the bamboo, and it's very close to Great Wall. And Great Wall is also has the same approach. The building is following the topography. Didn't cut the topography. It's very important for us. And in the center of the building, we designed this small tea house. And the drink tea is also very important for us, as a tea as a can bring us to the different world. And uh, then uh, I designed a tea house in the center of the building. This is tea house we designed. And this is a bridge to tea house. And the, the layers of screen again, and the we can the approaching nature. And uh, as the Shon san explained, nature near is very important for me as well. And in Italy, as I, I want to show the, the unique technique of Japanese carpenter. Japanese carpenters is, a, is also is a creating this small toy. Name is Chidori toy, and without any nail and without any glue, the people as a, can fix the joints. The three type of joints, the one, two, three, and finish. And as we as a, as, as a, did use this joint system for the small pavilion. And uh, my student actually constructed by themselves. And uh, after coming back from Italy, we tried to uh, realize a bigger construction by the same method. We tested the structure of this joint system in the university and the 10 meters high building, three-story building, was made by that structural system. And there is no column in the building. There's only the sticks. And the dimension is six centimeters by six centimeters. But it gathers and there's a, the structurally is enough. And good thing for this uh, structure system is as a showcase for museum also made by the same system. And also furniture, chair and table is all made by the same system. And uh, 
and uh, so in the mountain uh, in the mountain of Japan, so we designed the wooden bridge. And the uh, wooden bridge was, was very popular in Japan before 19th century. But in 20th century, so most of the wooden bridges were, were gone. But we tried to bring back that beautiful structure as, again. As, and uh, we worked with uh, the structure engineers to solve the difficulty of big spam by wood. And our idea is always try to use small intimate unit. The intimacy is very important for, for us. And smallness is also very important because the, our body is, likes to live with intimate material and intimate scale. This is inside of the bridge. And for the same village, I found this tea, small tea house with such roof. The, and so we designed a small hotel for the village the, with the facade of thatch. But it is very difficult to find the craftsman. As a, as a now, because the craftsmanship of touch gone, uh, almost gone in Japan. But as, as material-wise, such is very warm, and and also very humid, and I like the textures of touch. This is interior. It's a small hotel, but the people are selling the, the vegetable of the bridge and, and, those, and almost some of the local the products by Crossman. And uh, it's a very unique client for, for us. It's a Starbucks. <laughs> but as a, because of the location, as a, it's a in front of in front of this uh, Temmangu sh uh, shrines, the uh, Starbucks want to have the special shop. And this is our Starbucks. And the, again, the, the we constructed that the shop by sticks. And the sticks are working as structure of the building. Those sticks are supporting the building. And uh, so again in China, so in the mountainside, we designed one museum. And again, we didn't want to cut the topography. We tried to respect and preserve topography as it, it is. And uh, the building is following the topography like that. And. Uh, it doesn't look like new building because the the roof tile is coming from the old the the houses. So it's a recycled of roof tile of old houses. And I like that kind of color. Is so in Japan as a already the roof tile was is coming from big factory and mass production, and the same color and same size is, is very boring. And instead, the China, the still, the, those the natural material available, and I did use this material for the screen as well. The detail of the screen is important for this project. This is the detail. So we suspended, we suspended the, the roof tile by stainless wires, and we tried to control 
natural light. We try to bring wind as a control light, and, the, the, and we also create the beautiful shadow in the building. And uh, the, loo, the floor is, is, is inclined like that. As, uh, because as we are following the topography, we didn't cut the topography of the site. And uh, in the center of Beijing, as, uh, this is uh, just south of Forbidden City, as, uh, we did the uh, we did the project for the for the place. And uh, it uh, was uh, old old court houses. It's very traditional old court court houses. And some developers uh, tried to make the tall building. But the people the living he here was against the project, tall, against the tall, tall building. And some uh, the newspapers the, uh, the protested the project. And then finally, Chinese government decided to preserve the old houses. I think this is a, it's a very good, decision, smart decision, and uh, we, are in, uh, as a four architects, were invited to do the renovation. And uh, the, we tried to uh, create a screen between the street and the building. And as uh, actually, my office in Beijing is in that building, and uh, we are enjoying the life of the street. The, the street is called Futong, and a very, very human and very intimate, very different from the wide street of Beijing. And also interior, the wooden structures of old Beijing house is amazing. This is the, the original wooden structure of the house. Before I did that project, I thought it is a structurally, is a masonry structure by Bleak, but actually it is a wooden structure building. And as in Europe, as we also tried to as a, design as a, some roof and some screen and some natural material. In France, we did this project and uh, preserve the wood as a brick building and uh, create wooden screens to uh, the protect building and to integrate the building with environment. And as uh, a semi-covered space, so in Japan we call this kind of space engawa. Engawa is between building and gardens. And uh, also the Bawa's project in Luganga he designed the beautiful engawa so in between space, the creating beautiful shadow. So we propose the same idea in France. And also the, the, this hall is to connect city and nature. And uh, the, through this hall, people can feel nature is very near to the city. And uh, so our recent project in Paris is a new as a station as a close to Saint Denis Play of Football Stadium. And uh, so it's a very dense district in Paris, and uh, we try to uh, bring nature to dense district. And the uh, building is melting into the topography of the place, and uh, material-wise, it is made by wood. And uh, as a, as a, uh, a railway companies, as a, as a beginning, they didn't want to use wood for the building, but finally, they said okay to use wood for the station. As again, the screens and slope 
and creating a new topography in the city. And instead, as a Portland, Oregon, so we designed this museum. The idea is coming from Japanese village. The Japanese village, as, a, as, a, as a we sometimes have this kind of the, the plaza, and uh, the, the, the plan-wise, we call this type of planning goose flying planning. So by so adapting goose flying planning, so we can create many corners. And each corner can, um, can create close relationship with gardens. And uh, for example, this kind of corner. This kind of corners, as a, and we can open up the windows, and if weather is good, so we can create this kind of close connection with nature. And interiors, the screen again, and uh, so we did use local wood, the from Oregon, to the building. And the Briande Dandy is a, is a hint is a, for the building. So because is a, is a sea cliff of Scotland, so I like the textures very much. This is very different from concrete. This is very different from metal. As a, as a, it's a beautiful as a creation as a, of natures and composition of sea and land the, uh, can create this kind of beautiful textures. And location-wise, it is very similar to sea cliff. So we push the building a little bit into the river, and then the, the people the, the can feel the, the earth in the building. And again, we try to connect city and river, and we cut the building like, th like that. Same as Hiroshige Museum, same as project in France. And uh, this is the hole, and uh, to connect uh, the river and the people's life. And for interior of the building, so we try to bring the Scottish oak and, uh, to create warm feeling. As a normal museum is a white cube, but this museum is totally different. And the warmness of wood as a, as a, as a can create totally different soft atmosphere for the museum. And also the wood, the detail of the wood is not straight again, it's vibrating and creating the wave. And uh, so now so we are designing a small pavilion for Brilliant A London. And this is our first sketch of the project. And uh, this is a mock-up so, of the pavilion. So we try to combine bamboo and carbon fiber for making uh, this the structure. Uh, and I like to do that kind of a small pavilion because when I do the small pavilions, so we can test many ideas and also we can get many hint from material. And uh, for the bigger project, sometimes we can bring that idea, we can extend that idea to the, the bigger scale. And in September 14th in London, as it will as a, have the, the opening ceremony, and if you have time, please come to join the opening ceremony, September 14th. 
And I'm very much interested in combining contemporary technology and traditional material. And uh, so we, as a, as a, uh, as a combined, the so bamboo and carbon fiber film. The so carbon fiber is very light and very strong. And, uh, and uh, so I want to show the project by carbon fiber. So this, the original building was very old building. It was a very normal, very standard office building. And the structural reinforcement was needed. And the normally structural reinforcement is done by steel bracing, something like that, but it's not so elegant. And instead, we used carbon fiber and the carbon fibers can create shadow and a very, very light transparent screen. And this is a detail of carbon fiber. And uh, the, this idea, a little bit similar to our new project in Dunukanga. As a national state Olympic Stadium is almost done, as a, uh, and our idea also is a, coming from some traditional building and some contemporary technology. As we try to integrate the green and building. Like Kandarama, so we try we, uh, the bringing the vegetation in the building. And also, the roof to create shadow is very important for stadium. Because summer in Tokyo is very, very hot, so I want to create the series of shadows like this building. This is a, a Holyuji temple, as uh, it was built 7th century. This is still 7th century building surviving. And it's, it's, a, it's the oldest wooden building in the world that because of this section. And the series of roof is protecting building from sunlight and rain. And in Asian building, the, we, the roof is always is a very important element, very important design. And also, the, the, uh, this part, soffit, is very visible from ground, and we carefully designed the soffit like this. And uh, so we tried to use the cedars, local cedars, from 47 prefectures of Japan. That means from north to south, so we want to show the the diversity of Japan, because house, the wood from south is, uh, has very light color, wood from north is a little bit dark colors, and we can show, the, I can show the diversity of Japanese climate and diversity of Japanese as the local culture. And this is uh, as a, as the interior of the stadium. Also, the, the roof, as is made by wood. And the natural ventilation is always important in Bawa's building. And the wind, as a, instead of air conditioning, as a, he as a, as a carefully as a designs the flow of wind. And, this, and the, for, this, for the bigger project, I also want to avoid air conditioning. And as the angle of soffit is, uh, is calculated by computers, and the pitch of wooden louvers also simulated as a, by natural wind in the site. And uh, materials, the, those material, recycled materials is used for the sky walkway on the building. And our idea is open the stadium to public so every day, 
365 days a year. And the sports event happens in just as a, a few times a year. But the, this kind of public space is very necessary for community, we thought. And also, the, the, we designed the, the creek the besides the stadium. Because the building itself is very important, but garden is more, sometimes more important than the building. And uh, instead, as a, besides those bigger projects, I like to design small pavilion, like the pavilion for Lunuganga. It is a small trailer house. The trailer house in 20th century is, is an invention of America. It's a steel and uh, aluminum and those industrial material. But this is a trailer house was made by wood, and a totally different warmness happened in, the, in that uh, the trailer house. The same size, it's not big building, it's not 2.4 and 6 meters, and uh, totally 14 square meters, but very, very comfortable because of wood. And uh, so sometimes people uh, the, uh, can use this as a, uh, as a, as a private villa, but sometimes <coughs> the people did use that as restaurant. And in the center of Tokyo, uh, so we open the, these restaurants by ourselves. And a uh, good thing for this uh, restaurant is we, don't, we didn't need building permission because this is just a mobile car. Mobile car so, so. And, uh, and we opened this restaurant so in one year, but as a, still people are talking about the experience in that wooden restaurant. And as uh, these small pavilions we did in Italy, we worked with ceramic company. The ceramic tile is usually the use for cladding. The concrete structure and the ceramic tile is at very 20th century. But our idea is to use ceramic tile as structure of the building. This is the models, and this is the structural analysis, and uh, so and uh, so we did use as a, the stainless pipe and ceramic tiles. So open those two materials so we can create that very transparent structure. And uh, also in Italy, so we designed this unique pavilion by umbrella. And uh, the Milano Triennale, you know the, this event, the Milano Triennale invited me, and the, the theme the they gave us is as Casa de Tutto, as Casa de Tutto, but in Japanese, Casa means umbrella, <laughs> and then we found this solution. Casa de Tutto is umbrella house, is my translation. And, uh, but as a, as a, to use umbrella is very, uh, very smart idea for creating this light temporary pavilion. I got a hint from Buckminster Fuller, but Buckminster Fuller's dome is basically flame structure. But this umbrella building is, uh, has no flame. The, the, the secret of this, the structures is tensegrity structures. Tensegrity is, is, is a balance between 
the tension of membrane and the compression of the small tiny flame. And we combine those two things together to create the this light the pavilion. And 15 students work together, 15 umbrellas. They brought 15 umbrellas. And uh, the space is enough for 15 students to sleep. And this is the windows for the um, um, umbrella house. And uh, this is the entrance door, <laughs> like the small entrance of tea house. So as you know, the Japanese tea house has always has small entrance. Uh, likewise, we, have, we designed this small entrance. And the student really enjoys a life in the umbrella house. Drinking here, so sleeping here. Mm -hmm. And this is a material of umbrella. Uh, this is a, yes, as a, as a project for MoMA. The MoMA invited us for, uh, to participate, form deliberately the, uh, the uh, exhibition in 2008. So we got a hint from this polytank. In construction site, so we always as a, as a can find the, this water tank. And the good thing for water tank is, uh, is controlling weight. If we put waters, so it's very heavy, solid, and if we throw waters, so it can be light, and we can uh, the move to new construction site. As uh, uh, so we designed this shape, and by rotating system, we as a produce this new type of tank. And good thing of this part tank is the uh, is the circulation system of water. A normal tank, the water cannot be circ as, as a as a flow, but this type tank system, we can create flow of waters and uh, we can create flow of water in the wall and in the building. And uh, the, this is an experimental house made by the, this unit the, in Tokyo. There are also students uh, work together with me and uh, connecting the pipe Collecting the tank, and uh, this is the final the products. And our idea is, the hot waters and cold waters can flow in the wall, and we can c control temperature by the uh, ch choosing the temperature of water, and I. It's a new system. It's a normal house, normal building. The structure system and pipe system and interior all separated. But in this house, so all the systems are integrated. Like the, our body. Our body, the structures and the pipe and the surface all integrated. As a, as a likewise, the, this as a house can achieve that kind of integration. And uh, so finally, as I want to show the image for the gift project for Lunuganga. So I got the hint from these beautiful chairs designed by him. It's just a beautiful curvatures and very transparent as it is as it is melting into the beautiful gardens of him. And uh, this is the first sketch of our uh, the Lunuganga project. The materials, we, uh, this is a, 
as a structural analysis. And material is very important. This material is uh, Kitsuru. It's a, it's a local plant. It's a, it's a Kitsuru is a, I like the beautiful line of Kitsuru leaves. And we try to bring Kitsuru to that pavilion. This, and uh, this kind of line. And uh, the, it's very similar to carbon fiber project. And the, but the material wise, carbon fiber is very contemporary and the Kitsuru is very natural, but the same impressions we can get. This is a mock up of Kitsuru as a screen. And uh, by using these materials, so we try to create the harmony with the beautiful gardens of Runuganga. And uh, the always, the, the Jeffrey Bauer's building the, can give us many inspiration. And he tried to as a, as a, as a create from the place. He respects the place, he respects plants, he respects topography, and, and he, as a, as he has a strong idea for creating new environment. And then his space is not nostalgic. His space is always very new for us. And uh, I also want to do the same as an approach to the place. Thank you very much. Kengo-san, I just want to say thank you very much on behalf of the Lunuganga Trust and Jeffrey Bauer Trust. My name is Suhanya Rafael. I am a trustee, and I know today being Jeffrey's birthday, we, I think it's very apt to have an architect like you speak and honor Jeffrey's work, but also see, we can see influence, innovation that you have made. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we leave, I do also need to thank others. This would not be possible without a range of people committed to the work of the Trust. And the memorial lecture has always been supported by Miles Young. We couldn't have done it without him. And of course, Angela Endron, who sits with us through this journey. So can we just say thank you? I have to say on behalf of the Trust, I'm just thrilled to see how many of you have made the effort and commitment to come this evening. I feel this is the beginning of our centenary celebration of Jeffrey's work, his legacy, as friends, as family, as professional colleagues, as audience. And as part of that, Shari mentioned our centenary program. So I really want you to look up the uh, website, our Bauer 100 website, to see other programs as they roll out across the year. Jeffrey is a big figure, and one day is not enough. We need an entire year to celebrate him. I also want to say um, thank you to the team that has helped put together the Bauer Centenary Program with the Trust. Without all the four of you, we could not begin this incredible journey this year. So with that, I also want to say thank you, Kumasan, for coming to Sri Lanka and celebrating and marking Jeffrey's 100th year. Thank you.